Good morning, church. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. It is a joy to be with you this morning, Easter Sunday morning. We always say those last few weeks, one body, one church, many places. So welcome this morning to Easter services together scattered all over. I'm so glad you're with us. Let's open this morning in praise to the Lord. was buried beneath my shame who could carry that kind of weight it was my too till I met you sing with me I was free was mine too till I met you. You called my name. Here we go. You called my Amen. 
Pastor Chris, come on up. Well, good morning. Happy Easter. He is risen. Amen? He is risen indeed. Yeah, you know the response. Amen. What a beautiful day for us to be together to celebrate Easter, to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, on this day. I hope this finds you well. I hope, um, I hope that you are all healthy and well, although I do know there are some who, who have been a little bit sick and have some, uh, some health issues that they're concerned about. We continue to pray that healing will come and that you will see that soon. Amen. Well, interesting, and, and, and what a great way, though, that we can celebrate. We celebrate together. E- even though we are apart from each other, we are not physically in the same space as each other, but, but we are together. We are together in spirit. We are together under the same story and lordship of Jesus. Hear, hear this invocation this morning. O oh God, who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature. Grant that we may share in the divine life of him who humbled himself to share in our humanity, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Sarah will bring greetings and any announcements that might be of importance for us in these days and in these times. Good morning, church. Happy Easter, day 28, coming from my home office and have a few announcements for you once again this week. Um, Thank you so much for your giving and your generosity. We ask that you continue to give your tithe and offering. But let me tell you a few ways on how you can do that. For Venmo, it is The Connection Church. For PayPal, it is connectionnaz.org. For the email, it is finance.connectionnaz.org or old school. Get an envelope, put a stamp on it. 1300 Park Street, Castle Rock, Colorado, 80109. Thank you again. We really appreciate it. Secret Sisters, wow, it is hard to be secret when you're not taking your little gifts and prizes in and out of church. However, we will ask. Please remember your secret sister and drop a card in the mail. Just remember not to put your return address on it. That can be tricky, but just a thought can go a long way. So we really do appreciate that. Also, last week, we talked about what we're calling our first responders during the pandemic. And let's continue to pray for them. We did get some news this week that one of them that work in the hospital have been moved to actually working with the COVID patients. So let's remember that individual in prayer. Let's pray that they have the stamina that they have the energy, that they have the peace of mind needed, and perhaps even be able to be a witness to those that they are helping. So thank them so much. Also this week, please remember Val in prayer. You will be receiving an email from Pastor Cherie on more details, but there are some health concerns there. So please pray for Val and then Bill and family, and you'll be learning more about that, of how we can support them during this time. So look for the email, more to come. I will tell you, and a few weeks ago, when Pastor Cherie actually brought the message, she said something that really resonated with me. And during this pandemic, it has continued to do so. And I have this written down in my phone, and I, I'll just say, think about it every day. So here's the line that hopefully will resonate with you as well. How we love others is intimately linked to our love for God. So I ask myself, how am I showing his love? How am I connecting to someone? And if you haven't connected to someone, I ask you to do so. Have a wonderful Easter. And again, virtual hugs. Love you all. Now back to Pastor. Thanks. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's continue in worship this morning.
a favorite. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He bled and died.
Lord, you're good. And we give you praise for you are the one, the only one who saves. And Lord, not only did you die on the cross for us, but you beat death. And Lord, for that we give you praise because you're always transforming things that are dead into things that are living. And so Lord, do that in us today. The places in us that are dead, the places in us that are afraid, the place in us that are hiding in the corner, that are overwhelmed by anxiety, bring them back to life. You're always turning graves into gardens. You're always turning shame into glory. You're always turning ashes into beauty. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along, put me back together. And every satisfied here in love sing with me there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you i'm not afraid Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountains is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace. better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Sing that again with me. There's nothing better. Our morning to dancing. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. Sing it again. Morning to dancing. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty.
into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the Jeff Glover this morning reading scripture today. Early in the morning of the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple left to go to the tomb. They were running together, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and was first to arrive at the tomb. Bending down to take a look, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he didn't go in. Following him, Simon Peter entered the tomb and saw the linen clothes lying there. He also saw the face cloth that had been on Jesus' head. It wasn't with the other clothes, but was folded up and in its own place. Then the other disciple, the one who arrived at the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They didn't understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. Mary stood outside, near the tomb, crying. As she cried, she bent down to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels, dressed in white, seated where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and one at the foot. The angels asked her, Woman, why are you crying? And she replied, They have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've put him. As soon as she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Don't hold on to me, for I haven't yet gone up to my father. Go to my brothers and my sisters and tell them, I'm going up to my father and your father, to your God, and my God. Mary Magdalene left and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Then she told him what he said to her. The word of the Lord. For those of you this morning that have never heard the story of Jesus Christ, this song speaks of that entire story of how much he loves you that he died on the cross for your sin and that he rose from the grave to conquer death and he longs to know you I cast my mind to Calvary Jesus bless
Amen. Oh, praise the name of Jesus. Thanks, Sheree. Uh, let's pray together this morning. If you would, find yourself again in a, in, in a posture of prayer. If you would, uh, use, your, use your footstool or your couch or your bedside, whatever the case may be. Um, and let's spend some moments in prayer this morning. Um, prayer and, and praise for what this morning is, this Easter morning. God in heaven, oh, we are grateful this morning for this story that we are celebrating. We are grateful for your presence that is indeed at work in this world, for the redemption of this world. God, would you, would you help us? Would you continue to move in us and shape in us your spirit of goodness and grace? God, we pray that 
that this story of redemption, this story of new life would, would, would surface in new ways in these times that, we are, that we're quarantined. God, may it be all the more special when we come back together. May, may it be that your church realizes anew what it is to gather together as your people. God, may we find renewal in the midst of this almost forced fast that as we are uh, separated from each other, that we would only grow in our longing to come together. Uh, That we would grow in our understanding of what it is to be the church, not to simply go to church. That it is being the church is being a people that gather, that that gather for, for praise of you that gather to be to be part of the re-narration of humanity that you told while you walked this earth. God, we pray new life. I pray new life over us. And there's all sorts of ways that I believe that can take place. That might be physical healing that might be emotional and spiritual healing that might be relational healing and wholeness that takes place but god ultimately we pray and we believe that it is you who brings that about who brings about health and wholeness and renewal that new life is of you as we watch the spring buds come may we be reminded of what you do in our lives. So God, not only will we be a healed people, God, I pray that we would uh, be healers as well, that, that the new life you put in us would bubble over into the lives of those around us, that we cannot help but to reach and speak to our neighbors of your story. I know we, we're in a new place of interaction with our neighbors, but that new place isn't total separation, but maybe even a closerness. That no longer are we simply closing the garage door behind us, but now we find ourselves walking the green belt or the open space and saying hi to those around us in new, in new ways. So God, we believe and we also pray that, that in the midst of struggle and tension, that you are at work doing new things. And so this Easter, we pray that new things and new life would take shape in your church and in this place. Not this place physically, in this place in which we reside called your kingdom come so may your will be done in our lives and in the lives of those around us just as it is in your heaven amen amen well uh this morning um you heard just a little bit ago the passage read out of john chapter 20 um you heard that from from Jeff. I I know that that the Easter sermon is usually wrapped around those, and it is still wrapped around that passage in John. But ultimately, I want to take the passage take a passage out of Colossians, uh, Colossians three one through four, where where the Apostle Paul is is speaking to a people about what it is to live in their resurrection so so if indeed they were baptized with christ they were raised with christ as well raised out of the water cleansed from their sin and brokenness so so this is the 
the in short the context, but then after I read it, I want to I want to open up bigger the, the context of Paul's letter, Paul writing to the the Colossian people and 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 what that looks like. So so contextually, we'll we'll look at it contextually within the grand story of Scripture, and then contextually around the 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 Roman Empire in which Colossae um, was embedded, and then more closely we'll look at it as the people of the church in Colossae and what they were dealing with. So that's where we'll go today. Um, and, and hopefully my, my intent then is to, is to open up what it is to live into our resurrection and, and what it is to say that he is risen and what that means in the life of the church, in the life of God's people. So, so go with me, Colossians 3, 1 through 4 is where we'll start. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Therefore, if you were raised with Christ, look for the things that are above where Christ is sitting at God's right side. Think about the things above and not the things on earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So uh, recently I've spent time um, in, in this study and, and looking through some of your familiar, maybe you're familiar, if you're not familiar with, check out thebibleproject.com. But, but the, the Bible Project ha- has has a host of, of short videos that, that open up the scriptures in particular ways. Um, and it's, a, it's a beautiful way of, of opening up the text and how to, how to read and understand scripture. In fact, in, in fact it is in, in, um, in their, their series section of, um, of their video library is... is how to read the Bible series. Um, And it contextualizes is really what it is. So if the Bible is full of all different genres of text, then the way we read particular text makes a difference. It it changes things. Uh, So to read prose is different maybe than to read the prophets. Or to read poetry maybe would be different than reading a letter, which is what we're reading out of now. To read the prophets would be different. You get the idea. So so the the reality is is we're not reading Scripture differently like we're using different ways with our mouth. No, we're reading Scripture differently with our our spirit, with our ethos. The, The way in which we read, the way in which we intake Scripture would be different than the way in which we intake a math textbook. So that, that, was the, that, that was the starting point that, that made me think, oh, man, this could be cool to, to read through, um, to read through and, and study through the idea of, of an epistle on Easter rather than, rather than being focused around the Easter story. Although, that being said, I know that sounds like I'm separating the two. I'm not uh, because this particular passage of Scripture is speaking clearly to what it is and what Easter really meant, what this story is. So let's let's get into it. And we first need to start. We first need to start understanding um, um, where where the epistle falls in the grand narrative of Scripture. So so let's understand Scripture from really from beginning to end. It is a story of, of God's work in the world, but it's also a story of humanity's work in the world. And there's this grand tension that is at work in the story. And if we remember from the beginning, the story opens up, Genesis, God creates. God creates this beautiful world, this, this Eden that is teeming with life. From, from, from chaos, God brings order and he shapes the world in in beautiful ways, and he creates humanity and gives humanity this responsibility or this this job, if you will, maybe you'd call it a vocation, 
to partner with God in the creation of the world. To, to co-create, in fact, to till the ground, to, to garden with God, right? To, to, in fact, be the gardener in this world where, where humanity cultivates the land so that the land produces more fruit. This, this beautiful story and narrative is, is of God and humanity working in this synergistic way, moving through life, creating new life. Uh, but in the midst of that, there's, there's a choice given. Humanity can choose to, to live with God and live under God's reign and God's lordship and to partner with him in this way. Or, or humanity can say, well, you know what, I think we've got this. And, and I think we'll, we'll do this on our, on our own terms. And we know, we know the story. We, we know the, the choice. The choice was that humanity would simply, would, would simply live on their, on their own terms. And, and the spiral downward begins in the Old Testament text, where, where humanity slowly, slowly, and further and further falls away from from God's story and God's goodness. And then along the way, and we're hitting this with a broad brush, but along the way, God reaches out to a guy named Abram. Abram, would you, would you partner with me? Will you, will you covenant with me to, to be a blessing to the world? And so in this world that is full, again, of, of chaos and and destruction, and brokenness, and all this. God says, hey, Abraham, or Abram, to begin with, would you, would you partner with, would you covenant with me to be a blessing to the world? So in the midst of brokenness and chaos, Abraham, would you cultivate a new family? Would you cultivate a, a new people? Would you be the father of this new nation that will, that will bring my blessings about in the world. And so Abraham covenants with God. And, and still yet, we, we watch the story unfold. And it's a, it, there's, there's stories of, of God's miraculous intentions of the world happening. But then also, there is a continued, continued humanity imparting into and so you see the tension between God's good work in the world and humanity's destructive work in the world and the, and the tension begins and we see again the spiral of humanity and relationship with God it ebbs and flows there's moments where there's this beautiful relationship between God's people and himself uh, b- but then it, it spirals into self-destruction and more destruction. This is the story of Scripture, that God is always at work for the redemption of humanity, that God is always at work calling humanity back to himself in in love and grace, that that God is always inviting. And then we get to the story of the New Testament, the story of of Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, still, still yet, God's work in the world for the redemption of the world. This time it's himself in the form of his son to fulfill the message that God wants to redeem the world. This story of Jesus, that this story of Easter that we're celebrating today, this, this story that says God came into the world, he, he put on human flesh and dwelt among humanity, lived among and in the life of humanity only to speak life and goodness and grace, to, to live as the new Adam, the, maybe, maybe even the, the new Abraham, and that he would be the cultivator of a new people, a new people that are becoming the new humanity, that, 
hu humanity living into a narrative that seems always to lead to destruction. And Jesus steps in and speaks to that destruction and says, there's another way. So, so that's the, the grand story and the first contextualization of what we're going to read out of Colossians. That, that Paul is speaking into this grand story, that God is at work in the world redeeming it. Now, Paul's writing on the other side of Easter, right? So, so Jesus has happened. Jesus' death and resurrection has happened. Resurrection has happened. Paul has had an experience with the resurrected Lord. And Paul then finds himself deeply compelled to live as herald of this story. So Paul travels and travels and travels, speaking his story of, of redemptive activity by way of Jesus Christ. So Paul has started a handful of churches within the the Roman culture. That this leads us into the second contextualization that, that Paul is speaking into a Roman culture. The Roman culture uh, we're probably fairly familiar with. The Roman culture, they, they, they grow to empire by way of power and control, by, by sheer force. Might makes right. So, so the Pax Romana, right? They would say, if you're Rome, you could say Rome brought peace. But if you're not Roman, it may not have been quite so peaceful for you. But this is what empires do. It's the same as what we call in sports a dynasty, right? A, a dynasty is, a, is, is the, the Lakers of the 80s, right? Or, or whatever. The, the, the dynasty, the, the organization that steamrolls for so long that they become dynasty. Or, or in Rome's terms, they become empire. They, they roll through culture after culture, imparting their own ways of being. And so become empire. This is, this is the New Testament culture, living under the reign of, of empire, uh, but there's there's an interesting there's an interesting tension still yet uh, that that empire, if we we could shape it in that way, as being a big a bad empire that just that just steamrolls any other nation. Um, but then we could also say, but wait, the Romans they 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 brought the aqueduct, uh, they brought water to places that didn't have much water. They they built roads and, and, and there was a whole economic system that the Romans brought to the world that was, that was beyond all others that the world has ever known. Uh, but not only that, if, if you were a Jewish people, you may have been uh, conquered or steamrolled by the Romans. Uh, but the Romans still yet brought this economic. Uh, but also... The Romans are now protecting you from any other invading armies. So it's a really interesting tension to live in. The first century, very interesting to say, man, the, the, the Romans, they're not necessarily my friends, but the Romans, they, they protect me and they, they give me job. Oh, they highly tax me. They, they overtax me, in fact, for the sake of building roads and aqueducts and all this kind of stuff, or really padding the hierarchy's salaries. Uh, but still, yeah, life is good enough, maybe. This was life in Rome. Rome being a very dog-eat-dog -dog world, maybe you could say, where, where you could indeed fight your way up in the, in the social hierarchy. You could, in fact, scramble up, but it was usually if, if you scrambled here, you might knock somebody off here. It, it, that it was a highly competitive culture. A highly competitive culture. But this what is what began to set the first century Christian church apart. Is the first century Christian church didn't live into that 
hierarchy. The first century Christian church understood resurrection as new life that, that was an equality of life. That we wouldn't fight one another for a hierarchy or a space in the, in the higher echelon of society. That this kingdom that Jesus brought was a, was a kingdom that was reshaping the, the social order. Reshaping the social order from, from the haves and the have-nots to the we share all things together in common, right? We read in the book of Acts. This story that Paul is speaking Paul is speaking this story into the Roman culture. So if we understand Roman culture in this way, then Paul is herald of this story. Jesus' kingdom come. Jesus will be done. As we read in Matthew 5 on the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are meek, the merciful, pure in heart, the peacemakers. This language, this story that Paul is heralding to the Colossian church and really to all the churches that he writes letters to is this story that nobody is better than an other. Social status did not reign in the kingdom of God or in the Christian church. You can probably see the problem with this, though. If you were a person of status... It might be a difficult sell. It might be a challenge to participate in the same way. You might remember the story of the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus and asks about this kingdom and how can he attain it. He, he's, he's lived into all the rules. But what else? And Jesus calls for his very self. Oh, he said, sell all your things and follow me. But really the reality that Jesus was saying is, is, is let loose of, of your very self, your very essence, and come into this new way of being. That rich young ruler went away sad. He, 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 he appears to be unable to release that that place maybe it was his social status that he couldn't release maybe it was his economic that he couldn't release uh, i i don't know but whatever it is he he was sad that there was this alternative narrative that jesus was speaking to that he really was challenged with but then on the other side of that story is a story of zacchaeus a tax collector who had swindled a lot of people he made himself rich he he lived well into the roman economic he he stepped into the roman world just fine and he benefited from it at least economically and when jesus interacted with him and when he interacted with jesus he was compelled he was compelled by this new way of being human this new way of living and acting in the world that no longer would Zacchaeus live into the economic and social order of Rome, but that he would give back to all those that he had taken from. He was transformed, and this is the transformation that Paul is looking for as he writes letters to these churches across a world that lives into the Roman influence. But there's another story that speaks to this a little bit as well. We talked about it just a couple of weeks ago, the story of Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, so too, lived well into the social order of the day. It, it helped him. It moved him. His, his economic was, was good. His social status was good. But when he interacted with Jesus, he was compelled also with the story that Jesus keeps telling, this story of generosity and hospitality, this story where, where all are welcome to the table. And not only welcome to the table, there's a place setting 
for everyone at the table. And Nicodemus is so captivated, but still yet understands the tension of the social order in the day that he goes to Jesus by covering of night. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't want his contemporaries to know and see how and what he is interacting with. So he goes to speak to Jesus about that. He is compelled to this story of Jesus. These are all stories to contextualize where Paul is coming from. These are stories that Paul would have heard and known and that Paul was so too captivated with. So Paul writes letters. Paul, though, in this particular story, Paul is is the author of the letter, but, but this probably isn't a church that Paul started. And certainly Paul was well known. Paul was in prison during this letter, when he wrote this letter. And there was a man named Epaphras. Epaphras came from Colossae, someone who was from Colossae. And, and he, he had a small community of faith in Colossae. And so, so Epaphras goes to visit Paul. And Paul, what do I do with this church? What do I do with how they are being influenced? And so Paul, Paul responds, I'll, I'll write this letter, Epaphras, and let, let, me, let me write a letter of compulsion for this church. Let me write a letter that it might be a proleptic letter. That, that word has stuck with me over the months. You might remember a sermon from a few months ago talking about this word proleptic. It's not quite prophetic, um, Although, although it has a similar ring to it, but proleptic. Let me, let me shape it like this, this idea to speak proleptically. Um, my, my kids, are they, they really are good kids. In fact, in this time, we're, we're at home, and there's a lot of being around each other and on, on and on. But my kids, they're, they're friends. They, oh, there's, there's some, you know, there's times where, where, where they need correction, but they're good kids. And so when I correct them, I'm, I'm careful to help them know that I love them and, and, that, and that they are good kids. And so not only when I tell them, you're, you're good kids, you don't need to act this way, I'm, I'm telling them the truth. I'm telling them that they have been good, but I'm also telling them and speaking to them what I hope them to be, that they would remain being good kids. A proleptic statement. So Epaphras brings the story back to the church in Colossae, and that's where we get our third contextualization. And that is the context of Colossae itself. For Paul, the status quo was never good enough. Paul was always pushing forward, encouraging for more. Paul was always speaking to and against the pressures of the day, for, for culture always pressures a people. So we might see the pressures of Colossae. The pressures on, on one hand is the, the Roman gods, maybe Greek and Roman gods that they all kind of grew up worshiping. These, th- this side of the story might, might live and understand that that there's a, an array of gods, just, just kind of pick one. This side of the element, this side of the, uh, of the city, maybe you could say, they're, they're, they're living with just a mix of, and maybe even in the church they would say, oh, there's all these gods, we'll throw Jesus in, lump him in with all these other gods, and, and Jesus just kind of becomes another one of these gods in which to worship. So, so there, there becomes almost a bent of an antinomianism, where, where, whereby anything and all kinds of things can kind of just go. You can find yourself captivated with whatever, and so you, you grab and pull, oh, that makes sense to me here, that makes sense to me there, that makes sense to me there, this God has that to offer, this God has that to offer, and, and so it's just this lump, and, and ultimately what happens is Jesus becomes a condiment in, on top of it. So in case these 
gods don't work out, then maybe Jesus will. And so there's this, there's this influence that is happening, cultural pressure that is influencing the church in this way. You might call that the liberal end of the spectrum. Uh, but on the other side, there were, there were the moral police. Uh, there were the keepers of the law, right? Uh, there was that, that angle of pressure that would say, hey, hey, look, if we could just force everyone into these laws, then, then salvation for the city might happen. Um, if, we, if we can just make sure that everybody abides by these laws, let's just implement them. Uh, maybe if we maybe if we impose particular um, uh, particular actions against these laws, against breaking these laws, then then maybe we we could make society right again. And so the other side is a push against the other side. And then soon you get social binaries that begin to pressure against each other. And there's one side and there's the other side and there's divide and there's pressures and there's tensions and there's brokenness and there's all kinds of ill will towards the other. This is the culture in Colossae. There are two sides of culture. Uh, probably this same, probably this same tension, these same binaries are at work in most of the Roman world, but this certainly is what Paul is speaking to. But as Paul speaks to that, Paul is trying to make one thing transcendent from the others, and that is the lordship of Jesus. That if we would separate ourselves from these binaries, and, and it's not even a matter of coming to the middle. It's a matter of living under the lordship of Jesus, who is transcendent of these binaries. He is transcendent, but yet he descended, bringing his kingdom here on earth, is speaking to this life of renewal. This life of newness, this life that you would call resurrection. So don't live in this camp and don't live in this camp. Both of them are idolatry. Live in this camp that is transcended. That God in heaven has indeed descended to this earth to bring about his kingdom and his life. This is Easter. This is the story and the heralding that Paul continues to speak of, that Jesus is Lord and no one else. And so do not find yourselves captivated by the things of earth, but the things of heaven. You see, this is the life of resurrection, to live into thy kingdom come on earth now as it is in heaven. That the church becomes a people of hope, a, a people that, that live into the hope of the world, apart from particular binaries, but into the reign and lordship of Jesus Christ and him alone. You see, both camps speak to idolatry. So what Paul is declaring is that in Christ there is new life. And if we are to be raised with Christ, then we are to seek the things of Him, not the cultural banter that seems to suit whatever we believe best. In other words, Christ's death and resurrection is not for nothing. In Christ, the resurrected Lord, there is new life to be had. There is a new way of being human. And so instead of being captivated by the cultural binaries we are captivated by the lordship of jesus christ who speaks to a love and grace of all people it was in his resurrection that he conquered other gods and fulfilled the law 
So if you have been raised with him to this new life, to this new way of being human, then em- embrace it. Allow this new life to transform your life. Paul goes on after verse 4 in Colossians 3. He goes on and opens up what that looks like. So he says, So put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now, but now that you've experienced resurrection, Paul is saying, but now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and clothed clothed yourself with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. You see, we, we live in a world full of brokenness and pain. And Paul is calling the church to realize what it means to live into resurrection. And that is one of hope. A hope that transcends the life and death that lives around it. This, this is what waits on the other side of resurrection. A humanity that lives in love and grace and mercy for the other. This is Easter. This is the story. The story is that you matter. The story is that you have a place at the table. The story is that Christ came that you might find redemption in this world. Christ came that you might find healing within relationship. You might find healing physically. You might find healing emotionally, psychologically, whatever the case may be for you, that Christ came to offer you life and wholeness for good and forever. And so as we respond to that story, we respond, we respond as a people that live in hope, proleptic hope, right? Hope, hope that is to come, hope that is and is to come. So I invite you, I invite you to this life of hope. I invite you to this place of God's invitation to you to participate in the resurrection life. That is, that is a life that lives on the other side of death. That is a life that speaks hope and gladness, and goodness, and wholeness here and now. And so we always come to the table to tell this story in remembrance of him, right? In remembrance of this story that Paul so strongly heralds throughout all his letters and in this letter to the Colossians. That in this life, it is always about Resurrection. It is always about Jesus Christ and how he is shaping us to be a new people that live in hope. So if you would, come, come to the table of the Lord. If, if, you are, if you are knowing and understanding your need for Jesus, if you are knowing and understanding your brokenness and your need for healing, th- then please come to the table of the Lord. It is in the coming to the table that that we both declare our need for Jesus, Uh, but it's also, it's also a relinquishing of self. And it's also answering the call of Jesus found in this passage from Paul, that we would lay down 
the ways of the culture that so deeply influence us, that we would push off the ways of empire and live into the ways of the kingdom of God. So it is with this invitation that in unity within the church we confess our faith Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And so we pray as we come to the table. Holy God, we gather at this your table. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who by your Spirit was anointed to preach the good news to the poor, proclaim the release to the captives, set set at liberty loose, who are, opp- who are oppressed. Christ healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He ate with sinners and established a new covenant for forgiveness of sins. And we, we live in hope of his coming again. So it is on that night that he was betrayed. He took the bread and he took the cup and he gave thanks. He broke the bread for his disciples and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so, we gather as the body of Christ to offer ourselves to you in praise and thanksgiving. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, O God, and on these your gifts. Make them by the power of your Spirit to be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one in Christ, one with each other, and one in the ministry of Christ to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. If you have the elements with you today, please take of the bread and the cup and share at the table of the Lord. And here in just a minute... As I close out here, there will, be, there will be those that we've put in here, people, clips, so hang with, clips of our congregation, at least many of them, taking of the bread and the cup. Hopefully, hopefully this brings it into our home, maybe a little more personally, that we are indeed gathered around one table. Take a look at the rest of our church family, as they take of the Lord's Supper. Hear this benediction, if you would. And now, may the God of peace himself cause you to be completely dedicated to him. And may your spirit, soul, and body be kept intact and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who is calling you, he is faithful, and he will do this. Amen. Go in his peace.